This is where the future begins. It's time to invest in our future. It's time to help our schools improve for the future. And it's time to give our educators what they need to innovate for the future. Because the future of Texas is in our public schools. Public dialogue and civic engagement play an important role in improving the health and well-being of Texans across our great state. That's why Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is a proud supporter of free Texas Tribune events like the conversation you're about to see. By previous arrangement, I've asked our distinguished guests to spend a couple of minutes at the beginning of our panel talking about how they come at innovation, transformation, and disruption. And since I skipped you alphabetically, Dr. Kalon, I'm going to start with you. Um, as you, you, in fact, previously had, did you not, a, a title at the Dell Medical School that had the word innovation in it, right? When you first arrived, or not, lo not long after you were there, you, you own that vertical. Um, yes, I don't really own much of any vertical. I, um, I asserted it. You didn't say it. I said it. It's in my that's words. That's great. Right? I like it. I can, like can you talk, though, about how you're thinking differently? I mean, I, the, I, I was thinking about this. You know, each of you is, is, is coming at this differently. You're hoping to redefine the way people think about health. Yes. Talk about um, that. Thank you. Um, that, that's a great setup. So um, <coughs> the, the Dell Medical School um, is a, one of the two new medical schools that we created recently here um, in Texas. And uh, it's a great opportunity to rethink academic medicine and our role in innovating in health. Um, I have to say, before I say anything else, that coming here to McAllen, um, with this, which is where I landed, and here to Edinburgh, I actually am very humbled and reminded of how little I know. This is the first time I've come to the Valley. I think it's far too long. I've been in Texas now five and a half years rethinking health. Um, it also means, it, it sort of defines for, for me, you know, what are the boundaries uh, of, of where one takes one's knowledge um, and, and how we must be careful about um, the arrogance of our supposed expertise. I share this with you because that's what I was thinking about in the taxi coming here from the airport, being embarrassed that it had been so long before I came here. With that as a context, I'm going to jump into what I want to say. I can't help my, my passion, but I hope the, these few words in the beginning help you to understand that I'm ready to question um, any and all of it, and, and we have to have that perspective in health. So um, the, the lens we take um, across Dell Med is that we must focus on innovating in health. And I know innovation is a much used word. What we mean is that we need to be single-mindedly focused on big change that improves people's lives. And anything less than that is not the work of academic medicine. The reality is, for many of us, and I came from a fantastic institution in California, leader in the world, but the reality is the business constructs of academic medicine usually make it very hard to focus on the very innovation that I'm talking to you about. And that's because most academic medicine is tied to the healthcare industry as it sits today. <coughs> so if most of our innovation entities are funded between 50 to 80% by the margins made by our clinical enterprise, that is going to influence how much of real practical change we test and drive. That is true. That limits us. We have to get free of that. And that's one of the reasons why this opportunity for me in Austin, here, here also in parallel in the Valley, these opportunities to rethink how we innovate is so important. With, with that goal, then the only question can be, what does it mean to really improve health? That has to be the focus. And I would argue that as soon as that is the question, then lots of other things get realigned. Every piece of the puzzle. Is coverage through insurance important for health? Of course it is. Absolutely. But I do believe, and I've said this before, that it's not even table stakes. It is a stepping stone. It is just the stool before we even get to table stakes. That's just coverage. The reality is our healthcare system underlying it is terribly broken as much as it has the seeds of brilliance. I mean, some of the most um, biggest changes in, in neonatal survival in cancer have come from, from America. 
So it's not as if they're not these great technologically driven innovations. Yet, we should look at the results that we get for all of our population and be ashamed of the discrepancies between those that have the least and those that have the most. So for us, innovation has to embrace it all. But if you ask the right question, how do you impact health and then work backwards, I believe we can do better. Within that context, we do a bunch of things. One of the pieces is even in clinical care, really starting to go upstream, looking at things like telemedicine, other kinds of technologies. How do we really start thinking about not getting to someone when the knee needs to be replaced or the hip needs to be replaced, but getting them early when the first signs of arthritis shoot up and actually <coughs> managing that better? That does mean that you're going to reduce surgeries. That does mean if, if that is wildly successful, knee and hip replacement surgeries decrease. Those are the realities, and how that change comes about is going to create tension for existing players in the market. The second piece that we focus on is this big difference between what's good for health and the mechanics of the healthcare system. The mechanics of the healthcare system are hospitals and clinics and, and all of that apparatus. Very important in some cases, but actually not that important for a lot of other cases. For most of the management of diabetes, for a lot of management for hypertension, you don't need a lot of that apparatus. And the, and the truth is, the moment you touch healthcare, you spend not a buck, not five bucks, not 10 bucks, not even a hundred or a thousand. You spend a hundred thousand, right? I just bought health insurance on the marketplace for my mother, who is an immigrant in that very funny kind of a place where you don't have options for, for, um, for health care insurance. So we bought a completely um, unsubsidized plan and we threw out some numbers and I can tell you what we paid and what we expect to pay for my mother. We didn't take um, any of the subsidies. I'm really glad that those exist. Um, and that comes to $12,000 per year for her insurance and a $9,000 deductible. But I have to tell you, in our healthcare system, and I'm a very privileged person, just knowing that we could have that covered, even if at a maximum it's like 20K, was unbelievably a relief. My mother's stress has disappeared. She was terrified that something was going to happen. And, and in our system, you don't know where that's going to take you. So, so we have to look at all of the possible solutions to the question of health. We've been working on a platform to start working on something that Elena Marx brought up, the social determinants of health. We work on the <coughs> next level, because social determinants require reinvestment of, of large-scale resources, which we also need to innovate on and are. But right below it is midstream care. Like, How do you take care of a diabetic when they don't show up to the to the clinic, or even if they do show up to the clinic, maybe they don't need to show up to the clinic. There is a great room for, um, for new models of health that take the discipline of clinical protocols, but now apply it to medically tailored food, to social connections that, we, uh, that are delivered to your home, through people that really care about you, not in a fluffy kind of sort of halfway their way, but in a very precise way. So I hope we can discuss a little bit more of those and we can bring up some of the more recent news articles around uh, some of the most exciting work that have been done for the last 15 years or so. Some of you may have read about what we've learned recently about hot spotting um, uh, in, uh, through what's called the Camden trial, where we've gotten some recent evidence that is controversial and fascinating. So that I'm excited about that and I hope we can get a moment to talk about it because it starts getting into the detail that we need to get into to yep. really make this piece safe. Well, I'm going to bookmark hot spotting. I confess I did not, uh, I'm not aware of what that means, but now you have my curiosity peaked, so we will absolutely come back to that. Um, D Dean Krauss, I asked you here to talk, among other things, about um, graduate medical education. Many times today we heard called out that we don't just have uh, a shortage of coverage, say. We have a shortage of providers. We have a shortage of care. And uh, the legislative uh, apparatus is turned toward enabling more graduate medical <coughs> education, more residency slots, creating more docs who will hopefully be educated here and then as the trend remain here, right? So you're uh, running one of the two new medical schools, as uh, uh, Dr. Kalon said. Uh, how are you doing this differently than you might have done it Ten years ago, how are you thinking about the world ten years from now? No, no, thanks. And uh, Dr. Killen, you're a hard act to follow. Um, in she the is. sense that much of of what I want to talk about really is based on your observations and your insight. If we think about it, we're in a position now where we're trying to create a new cohort of differently trained health providers, 
And we have to do that differently than we ever have before because we can't just keep training people to become high profit fee for service providers in the model that we currently have. That's unsustainable. So let's go back and let's look at this big picture. If we're looking at medical education, the major issue with medical education is its cost. If you look at the average amount that a graduate physician comes out of medical school with, it's now $225,000. <coughs> so if you're coming out with a $225,000 debt, it prevents you from having a family as early as you might. It prevents you as a physician from perhaps buying a home. So what does that do then to that physician who's coming out? It influences the specialty that they choose. And now you have students who are trying to recover the high debt burden that they've had by going into fields that they can generate more income. And in the current model, that is not primary care. And it's not in the fields in which we try to keep people healthy. It's in the fields where we treat advanced disease, which is counter to the model you're talking about. So we need to invest far further upstream because we really need to change an education model to focus on health, to focus on prevention, to focus on primary care, and we need to reimburse those people and provide education at a reasonable cost so we can encourage our physicians to move in that direction. That changes residencies. That changes how people are employed. But we've got to challenge long-held assumptions on how healthcare is delivered, on how stakeholders carve up this this, this, the, the resources that are devoted to health care. So we're doing all of those things, and those are all important. We need to have more team-based care. There's no question that health in the future is going to rely not only on medical education or the physicians that play that role, but on our nurses, our nurse practitioners, our physician's assistants, our pharmacists. They all play a role, and there's very good data that using these providers will decrease the cost of care and at the same time improve consumer satisfaction. And you begin to move then toward realizing that triple aim that we're all trying to accomplish. So we need to reorganize medical education, Evan, to your point. We need to provide students with medical education at a reasonable cost. We're doing that here in Texas. Our tuition doll, uh, amounts are fortunately lower than in many parts of the country. We have partnered with foundations, and I want to give a shout out to the Clayburg yeah. Foundation has been very generous in supporting us for, uh, for student scholarships. We need to provide ways to have students enter good primary care residencies. And that includes psychiatry and mental health services, which are badly needed. And then we need to provide a payment model where they're reimbursed in a fair manner for the services they do not falling far short of the proceduralists in a model right. that we've already had. All of these call for a systemic approach, and medical education is just one stepping stone, if you will, in order to allow the healthcare providers of the future to address the ecosystem of health that we're trying to get to. I'm, I'm interested, D. I want to go to Dr. Uh, Garcia in a second, but I want, I'm interested in hearing you say that you are effectively looking out from here at the need and reverse engineering how you fill it by retooling the way that you educate these up and comers. The problem it seems to me though, and we had this called out earlier, <coughs> is that the market is paying specialists more than it's paying primary care physicians. You can only do so much alone, right? Yes. You can create more primary care docs, but at the end of the day, they're still gonna walk out into a world in which the market, not you, determines that they're paid less. No question. So what do you do about that? Well, it's a discussion. It's got to be a discussion with payers. It's got to be a discussion with employers. How do you package this care in such a way that you can provide better outcomes at a lower cost? And I know at Dell, they're doing that. If they look at their joint pain project that they've had at Dell, they can get better outcomes at 30% of the cost of standard ways of doing things. So we need to really retool and really think about how we prepare those physicians and other providers to work in that team-based environment with, right. where they're reimbursed and incentivized on the outcomes they get, not the number of units they it, produce. Quickly, one more qu question on this. Is it possible that the way to solve this problem is not on the back end, but on the front end yes. in this respect? You talk about how expensive it is to go to medical school and the debt that many students graduate. Could you imagine forgiveness of tuition or debt in exchange for solving some of the problems that you called out that Chairman Price called out. When Chairman Price said that there were 150 counties in Texas that have no psychiatrist, I thought, surely this can't be right. Mm -hmm. So if you're training docs to fill those enormous gaps, 
is it possible that the way that problem is solved is by saying we're going to forgive or reduce tuition, forgive debt, and somehow solve it through that it's door? It's a large part of it, and I think that has to be part of the solution. Again, I, I thank the Clayburg Foundation because they found, funded us right. to do exactly that. They funded a project that we're working on with them where they're bringing more primary care doctors to the valley, and what we're doing is incentivizing them in that way. We're providing loan forgiveness for them. We're doing things to get more primary care people trained into the valley, but it's going to take public-private partnerships to get there. Can't do it alone, right. Okay, Dr. Garcia, your, your uh, venue to innovate and transform healthcare is boring old technology, right? I imagine once upon a time every conversation about innovation and transformation would be involve somehow leveraging technology. But you're the only one up here of four really who is doing that, really, really, through the front door. Well, well it is a boring technology. Well, it's, it's, not, not, it's, but it's not boring to the people who are being served and, and seen who no, 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 otherwise would not. not be, right? Absolutely not. What, Talk about your business and what you've built. So what Guardian Health Solutions is, is a prime example of how all the pieces that we uh, uh, listen to today uh, come together when it comes to innovation, legislation, and above all, reimbursement. See, you can have the best technology and you can have the best ideas. If there's no reimbursement attached to it, it's very difficult for a business to do anything with it. So what we did is maybe we could say we did reverse engineer this because in 2010, there was no reimbursement for this niche market in telemonitoring, which, by the way, is a lot different from telemedicine. As a matter of fact, CMS separated telemedicine away from, or telemonitoring away from telemedicine to distinguish the difference, right? Telemonitoring is just simply putting a machine in a home of a chronically ill patient and receiving data. It is not a doctor talking to a patient. That's telemedicine, okay? So our niche market is telemonitoring. So getting back to, to, to what I was saying, when uh, in 2010 there were no reimbursements for this, uh, for this service, um, we tried to use it thinking we we're going to put it uh, together with a congestive heart failure program and try to reduce hospitalizations with no reimbursement. The units were extremely expensive, $3,500, $1,500, way too out of our, our uh, 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 budget. But we tried to do it anyway. We got a few machines, we put them into some CHF patients and reduced hospitalizations, 30-day rehospitalizations by down to 5%, which was tremendous, a tremendous uh, accomplishment. Well, there weren't a whole bunch of patients. We were talking about maybe 20 patients, but still, 5% rehospitalization rate on CHF. Great. It works. We're not getting paid yet. So, thanks to legislation, in 2012, Texas took the model that the state of New York had and became the second state in the nation to provide a reimbursement for vital sign monitoring on Medicaid patients, Medicaid. So by 2013, we started uh, to, to send our bills to Medicaid. We were getting paid handsomely, enough to cover for our costs. And on top of that, of course, we continued to get uh, the, the, uh, 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 the outcomes that we wanted. We were actually doing value-based uh, 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 medicine in 2013. And thanks to Representative Guerra and, and other representatives like Fort Price, who was up here earlier, uh, Don Buckingham, uh, Chuy Hinojosa, they have continued to support us in our efforts to continue this uh, innovation by keeping those reimbursements. So we have seen from 2013 to today a, an expenditure at the Medicaid side from $1.3 million in 2013 for all of telemedicine to probably over $40 million today. And that's to direct uh, reimbursements to physicians and to home health agencies in this state. And that's only covering 15% of our population. Only the poorest of the poor Medicaid patients uh, 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 qualify for this. But it may sound like a lot of money being spent, but in context of the entire, uh, uh, entirety of the, of the expenditures, right, it's very little. One hospitalization is $20,000, that's the average. 
if you just put pen to paper, that's not too many hospitalizations. So, so that so the technology that is now available makes this kind of work possible. It wouldn't have been possible a generation ago, and one imagines what will be possible a generation from now. That's it's right. kind of unsexy, right? It's just sort of you know, but it's really valuable, and in, in many respects, is transforming the access people have to care and the way that care is able to monitor patients. It's not that, that difficult. Yeah. The, way it, the way it works is like this. Currently, we have close to 10,000 Medicaid beneficiaries on machines since 2013 to today. 10,000 Medicare beneficiaries. When those little machines alert us, the, that, that information, that data goes to a 24-7 nurse call center where we triage them. We talk to them. We talk to them if they have alerts, and we talk to them if they don't take their vital sign that day. So we keep adherence high. Yeah. 75, 80% of our patients are doing at least 80% of their daily vital sign. We talk to them. We have patients that purposely do not take their vital sign so they can talk to Maria at the call center. They just need someone to talk to. Yeah. Now, how many hospitalizations have we reduced? I have no idea. We have no idea. But thanks to Representative Guerra and the other uh, legislators this year, we've added that to Health and Human Services in their annual report. They have to now show us what the actual cost savings is. So we're excited to hear that. Uh, uh, it hasn't come out yet. It's supposed to come out uh, this, this month. But you hope it's a good number. We, right. we anticipate it's going to be a good number. Yeah, and, and the fact is savings, uh, cost savings along with better outcomes is itself a form of uh, innovation in healthcare these days, especially with the costs uh, going up. So, Representative Gary, you know, I, we've talked about medical education. We've talked about medical professions. The legislature is probably the most change-averse of all of these institutions. Indeed, right? indeed. Indeed. And so you sit on the Public Health Committee where you're charged with legislating and appropriating on behalf of uh, the healthcare universe now and going forward. How are you all thinking about the Texas of tomorrow you need to serve? We know how the population is changing. Well, right? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I was first elected with a special election in 2012. And then um, uh, it came in regular session 2013. And I've been on Public Health Committee for four sessions. And I will tell you that the committee over the years has really changed in many ways in the mindset concerning these issues. Um, you talk about tele, te, uh, telemonitoring. That was one of the first bills that I filed. But I only could get the legislature to only approve it for two years at a time. Right. And it was like pulling teeth. And you would show them and you would, and, uh, uh, my fellow representatives, the cost savings involved, but the mindset was not there. So it took a lot of education and it took a lot of the good people from this hospital and throughout the state to make them understand, to make my colleagues understand the benefits <coughs> of it. So I'm glad you brought that up. But uh, I will tell you in, the, in, in, in public health, over the years, I've seen such a change in the mentality and the mindset uh, of the reps because what Texans need to understand is that there's a lot of rural Texas with hospitals that are shutting down and these folks have no place to go and more and more people throughout Texas are beginning to understand the importance of these issues yep. whereas in the past you're just going to spend our money. Well, the fact is, you're, uh, Representative, your hand, we talked about this with Representative Price, your hand has been forced on the rural provider front in that you've had 20 hospitals, more than 20 hospitals close in rural Texas in the last 10 years. Right? That's right. But there's another thing that I think is very, very important. I don't know if people understand this, but the great majority of the population in Texas, if you take I-35, take I-35, what is it? Over 80% of the people in Texas live on the east side. Cl close to 90 these days. Right? Yeah. yeah. On the east side of I-35, think about that. On the west side of I-35, I you know, Texas is a big state. Think about all those communities that are lacking in health care. So right. it's incumbent upon us to find the solutions and answers to those issues. But let me also say this. 
when this hospital, DHR was first built, I remember when Dr. Cardenas had a little, you know, they had a 10,000 square foot building and they were doing outpatient services. And then, um, and that was, an, in fact, is I had a procedure there done. Um, and I will tell you that when this hospital was built, it has transformed the Rio Grande Valley in many, many ways. And then A&M came in. Yeah. And so I think folks throughout the state are beginning to notice South Texas, the talent we have here. And I just got to tell you, um, it, it's exciting. We have an exciting future ahead, but we've got a lot, a lot of work yeah. to do. Dr. Kalen, the, the, one of the challenges that you and your colleagues at Dell face as you try to think about how Texas is changing, is we know certain things. Data is the <laughs> flashlight, right? We know what the way forward looks like. Population in the state's gonna double, close to double in the next 30 years. To Representative Guerra's point, we're becoming a much more urban state. Five of the 13 largest cities in the country are in Texas, more than in any other state. And demographic inevitability is not just coming, it's upon us right now. The population is changing dynamically as well as it's growing precipitously. How do those, po you're, you have a, a hand in the population health aspect of what Dell does. How do those population indicators drive your thinking about this stuff? Well, yeah. Sorry, I'm out of time to borrow. We'll give you oh, one. You got it. All there right. Go. Yeah. PhD in neuroscience gets me somewhere. Yes. Yeah, right. um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the good and bad of healthcare is that we have, we have such a, a looming challenge, even without those projections, that yes, we've been thinking about it for a long time. Right. Projections, uh, you know, the, dem the, the demographics aside. Um, these, th that just makes it worse. And so, yes. I guess, you know, so to, to step back to think about large scale disruption, because frankly, that's what healthcare really, really needs. And we have a privileged position in academic medicine that we are able to sit back and and think about it, so, so it's, a, it's sort of our duty to do that. So you know, the questions in my mind when I think about large-scale disruption that we'll need, especially for the projections you're making, include you know, a question to my, in my mind. You know, you're talking about telemedicine. It was actually funny, and I can see it happening, right, that, that people are turning off their machines so that they can talk to Maria. The system that, that we need is one that allows for competition on results. And I'm not sure as yet that Medicaid is any part of Medicaid is actually paying at that in that way. What happens in that way is we then allow for an ecosystem of competition that takes your great idea and your starting point, Mr. Garcia, right? So that you've begun something, you've shown something. But I would like to have some competition with you, right? I'd like to have a bunch of other providers focused on results, and some of them are gonna go, wait a minute, there's a lot of technology in this room that we're giving to patients, but actually 50% of our folks seem to just wanna to talk to Maria or, or someone. Maybe there's a bit smarter way to do this where we can dig in and figure out which people actually really just need someone to speak to, which by the way is a thing. This is not, again, a hand wavy piece. There well, is there, there's evidence, something innovative about, about that. It's like, right. th th so that's so right. there's, right. it's absolutely true that there is an impact of, of actually connecting to someone. The evidence has shown that when, after a certain age, when your partner dies, you have a 20% higher chance of passing away in the next three months. That's real, that's again not fluffy or anything. So when I think about the large scale disruption, I think about building on the kinds of things that you've done, but really pushing it to its limits and saying, if, if you had no healthcare, I'd love to start with if you had no fancy technology. And I actually come from a digital health and technology background as well, as you saw from some of my background. But I think the way we start is by saying, what are some of the basics we need to give and how do we innovate on that? And then we can layer on technology and then we can layer on really sophisticated healthcare. But we haven't pushed ourselves to that limit because that's just not what the system pays for today. So when I think about you know, the, 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 the degree of change we could get, I would like us to <coughs> imagine the lemonade stand version of delivering health, where you've got nothing and you start thinking about, well, what do I have to do to really get, say, this older person who's living at home by themselves healthier? Yep. What can I do without touching anything else? Okay, we can maximize through, you know, young college students that come from the region and knock on doors and we can track, you know, how does that impact A1C levels and how does that impact hypertension? And then layer on some of these more um, kind of, 
sophisticated and very interesting uh, advances that we're getting. I'm, I'm glad, uh, Dr. Uh, Dean Krause, I'm glad Dr. Kellen brought up the lemonade stand model because the assumption is almost always that you can only innovate and transform and disrupt if you throw a lot of money at it. And in some ways, she's talking about the reverse. Let's not focus on how much we can spend fancy new gadgets, this, that, and the other. Let's kind of zero base almost and ask ourselves really what works, what do we need? It may not be the most expensive thing, right? And I would well, say pay, it's, paying it's, for value. That's yeah. exactly what we've been, you know, paying for value is what you're saying. Right, right. paying for yeah. value. And I, w I would say that it's usually not the big, new, shiny, expensive object that makes the difference. Yeah. And I think we have so much focused on that. Uh, a new MRI, you know, I heard yesterday a conversation, we need a second cryo EM machine, $12 million. How many people can we help with that $12 million rather than invest that it's in It's almost never going to pay for itself, is it? It never is. So I agree we really need to look at this in a much different way. And we need to look at how do you provide the care that's needed to people that need it when they need it in a way that provides them what they need. And that's often not the high-paid specialist. In fact, it's usually not. Is there a way we can provide more care in the home? How do we reach out and use community health workers in a better way? Right. I mean, there are lots of ways we can disrupt the way that care is delivered and take money and build one fewer PET CT scanner in the, in the valley and use that $6 million to provide vaccinations to children who need them. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things we can do just by reconfiguring the resources we have. In some ways, uh, <laughs> the, the fact that you're a medical school associated with a public university means you have to go sing for your supper every two years, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. And, and again... It would but, be better if you didn't necessarily have to ask for money all the time. If you had to ask for permission or forgiveness to do things that didn't involve simply a big bag of money every two years. Right? Well, we certainly need money because there are projects that need them, and the state does provide those, and the legislature has been quite generous with us. But it can't us. be only that. But right? it can't be only that. The, uh, the me medical schools traditionally have gotten about 60% of their income from their clinical practices. And again, is that the right model? You know, should we be running a fee-for-service business that competes with the private health care industry right. in order to just keep our doors open. So we have to disrupt and innovate in the model of medical education and how, how medical schools keep their doors open and, ed and educate their students. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Garcia, I like the fact that Dr. Kalon said what you, we want now is competition for your business, right? Here's the thing 10 years after you started your business. A 17-year-old can build an app or can create a business with the technology in his bedroom to compete with you today at a much lower cost and at a much higher likelihood of success than was the case back when you started. Is that good or bad from the standpoint of how you approach this task of disrupting? The, the knowledge that the next person who's going to reinvent how this is done is out there. It's just the nature of the business. Yeah. That's right. what happens. Um, you know, in the, back in the 80s, we were all freaked out because we saw Mrs. Ramona Diaz with her $1,000 phone. And right. now you, they give them to the you. Probably si the size of a brick, right? Yeah. There's a big right. brick. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, I don't know if anybody here knows Ramona Diaz, but uh, <laughs> I'm from Stark County. Um, There's an actual Ramona Diaz in the story. Okay, good. That's yes, good yes, he is. Okay, yes, he is. Yes, he is. But, uh, well, she was the richest woman in, in, the, in town. Okay, and she had the big block phone. Yeah. Well, it's just the nature of the business. Like I said, in 2010, we were paying $1,600 for a Honeywell home ed machine. Yep. Then it went to a uh, $1,500 MedApps Health Pal, and now we get them for 150 bucks. Right. So the cost has right? gone down. So uh, are we are we uh, uh, ready for for um, uh, for competition like this? Yes. Yeah. Is it going to evolve? Of course, it's going to evolve. It's always evolving. Same thing with everything else in healthcare. Right. EMRs are better six months from now. Uh, same thing with the big companies as well. They they are always constantly waiting for that new and 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 uh, um, and uh, best uh, best thing. Yeah. What you can't replace though is talking to Maria. Yeah. Right, so that has to happen. You got to talk to her. There's an actual Maria in this story, also. E right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but you know, the other thing, uh, Dr. Garcia, the other thing that's evolved, honestly, in addition to the technology, is customer behavior. This generation's customers for your services 
will be different than next generation's customers. They right? are. Let me talk a little bit about what you mentioned about population. Yes, we're going to double in population, but not the young people. 50% of the, the increase in the population is 65 and older. We're going to need uh, one of those uh, Democratic uh, um, uh, candidates for president. Um, I think it was Amy Klobuchar or one of them. Um, and the reason I, I, I got this in my ear is because every time I see her on MSNBC or CNN or wherever she, she comes out in, she keeps saying the same thing. We're going to need a million health care jobs. We're going to need a million health care jobs for home health. Home health. That's music to our ears, right? It's music to our ears for those of us in the business. But it also means uh, something uh, very important, too. Where is health care going? It's going to the house. People want to stay in the home. 90% of those uh, folks that were 65 and older, they were asked, where do you want your uh, uh, health care to be? They said, in the house. I want right. to be at home. So we can't get away from that. Now, the business that I'm in is a niche market. It's just telemonitoring, right? The innovations that we're seeing are tremendous from artificial intelligence to, to all of these things, too. The value-based is, of course... We should be paying for value. But how about this idea? And we're talking about transformation and, and all these things. And no, I'm not going to say I'm going to take your AR-15s away. I'm not going to do that. What I am going to say is, what if you start paying patients for doing well? Have we ever thought of that? To incentivize patients. Yeah, for Maria, if you have 95% adherence rate and you're taking your vital signs every day, and I'm checking your medications and you're doing it just like you're supposed to, can we just pay Maria to be, be good with her health care? And not pay the person that's not doing their vital signs and not taking her medications? We've never thought of that. Why could we not incentivize the very right. person that we're trying to help? It's a different kind of pay for performance, right? Um, it is. Right, yeah. Uh, Representative Garrett, le let me come back. Uh, we've talked without actually calling them out specifically about the obstacles to change. One of them is there's never enough money. And maybe, in fact, it's the wrong conversation to be talking about money. Another is that we have, again, represented on stage and not, the notion of hidebound institutions. They say they're for change. They may even think they're for change. But the reality is it's very hard to turn a steamship whether it's a medical school or the legislature, very hard to get people to change. A third thing is aversion to risk. You know, people are reluctant sometimes to attempt things that they don't know for a fact will fail because the cost of failure is too great. And there is no institution that is as risk averse as the legislature, right? We don't want to try a lot of new things because if they don't work, somehow it's going to come back to bite us. Well, that's very true. Yeah. How do you uh, wire around But it that? all goes yeah. down to dollars. Um, it's the Texas legislature, obviously, for obvious reasons, is dollar-driven. Yep. And uh, it's very important that we understand that and approach things with that understanding. But I will say this much. The University of Texas um, and, and the medical school and A&M have been very impressive because of something that I think is very, very simple. Going out into the community and teaching our culture healthy attitudes about diet. When you think about diabetes and heart issues, heart complications, a lot of it goes back to diet. And these institutions are going out into the communities and making sure, or trying their very best to make sure that the population out there understands that. Look, let's take this area historically. Let's take this area historically. My family's been here since what? Um, the 1700s, like many of the families here, old ranching families. But back in those years, you lived off the land. And so things like, um, things like menudo, okay? Things like uh, barrocoa, that was commonplace. What these, and I'm not saying eliminate that, but what they're doing is they're making people understand throughout our communities, throughout our colonias, throughout our community as a whole, the importance of diet. Diets such as grains and, 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 and vegetables and the importance of that. Not <coughs> sit down and just eat a bowl of menudo once or twice a week. Right. 
or barbacoa. That is so, so important. And I think that initiatives like that are going to transform this area and, quite frankly, much of Texas so, because Texas is beginning to look like our population. So this aligns with what Elena Marx was talking about earlier, what uh, Dr. Kalon is talking about now, that the social determinants, the stuff on the front end, ultimately affects the stuff on the back end. That's right. And it doesn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money right. to implement these changes. And in fact, you may not be able to afford not to do that. That's that's right? absolutely because, correct. Because, and again, music to, music to my colleagues' ears right. in the Texas legislature being four sessions on public health. Believe me, right. this is music to their ears. So we're going to open up the floor for questions here. We've got microphones on both sides to give you an opportunity to get into this. Um, I see a person sprinting to the front, and please go ahead. We're happy to have you ask a question. Elaine Hernandez again. Yes. We live here in the Rio Grande Valley next to a great nation, Mexico. We know that the uh, health education or the medical education in Mexico is superb. And we know that many Americans cross the border regularly for their health care, their pharmaceutical needs, their dental care. Can we look legislatively into cross-border insurance mechanisms that then help to reduce costs? If this side we have a shortage of professionals and the care is very expensive, it is high quality but less expensive across the river. So that may be one innovation to consider, especially along the U.S.-Mexico border. Oh, that sounds easy. I'm sure that the government will go for that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, oh, It's almost as hard as, you know, pain, pain Maria. Yeah. Re Representative Garrett, what do you think the chances are that the legislature is going to wade into that territory? Well, I think we all, I think most of us re recognize that, to a great extent, that's a federal issue. Okay, uh, and to, to, to a great extent. Now, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that idea, but why are the costs lower over there? What is the reason? And I think these are the things that we need to look at. Why are the costs uh, less expensive in, in Mexico, so to speak? Not necessarily all of them are better, but why? And I think these, these are things that we need to study and find out. Um, uh, but again, I think a lot of these issues you're talking about is along the line of the federal government, and uh, I'm part of the Texas legislature, and so it, it, it definitely has an impact on that. The binational agreements between Texas and Mexico, like the border tuberculosis project program, so yeah. we already have mechanisms of cross-border collaboration for firefighters, for sure. TV. Zika so is an example. The Zika virus. Um, there's been a lot of cooperation between yeah. both countries, uh, and I think you have a. You, 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 you've latched onto an idea that, that I think has a lot of merit, but we are dealing with governments, and believe you me, I know it's a slow process. So I think these are things we need to explore. Uh, Dean, I'd, I'd like to yeah, say something about that. Please, please, start um, I've got a little bit of experience in, in, in that regard because I am a Mexican doctor, right? I did go to school in Monterrey, uh, spent seven years there. Uh, it's a six-year medical school with one year of what I call indentured servitude, where you work for the government for one year and you get paid 90 bucks a month. It's great for them. It's fantastic. Uh, I think your idea is, is not novel. I like it. There's uh, one of the panels actually mentioned uh, the population that's in most need is from El Paso down to Brownsville, which I hear is called the Fajita Belt, from <laughs> El Paso to Brownsville is where the biggest problem is, right? I also heard we don't have enough PCPs. Well, there's a lot of PCPs in Mexico, and there's a lot of Americans that are going to medical school in Mexico, too, and other foreign uh, uh, schools that are just as good but can't practice here. I'm being one of them. So it's a licensing right? issue. It's a licensing issue. Right. Now, again, maybe I'm putting my head out too far in this. But it's like uh, Representative Guerra said, yes, we're talking about governments, right? But why can't we make a free zone for at least 10 miles all along the border where you can actually license Mexican doctors to practice medicine on the 10 miles into the border and cover everybody there? You know? Um, I have a lot of friends, most of my friends are in Monterrey, they're all specialists, they all do well. But the average physician in Monterey gets paid $20,000 a year. 
full-blown family right. practice so guy. This, so this is an opportunity then. It's an opportunity. I'm not saying use Mexican doctors. I'm saying right. American trained yeah. physicians that are stuck in a donut hole and can't do their licensing here in the United States. Why can't you just give them that opportunity 10 miles or five miles along the border from, from El Paso all the way to the Brownsville? Well, that would be an innovative idea, wouldn't it's it? It's huge, I know. It would be. It's huge, but... You may have a wall problem. I, I just, <laughs> not, a lot of things are or, popping into my head. Or, or, or maybe, Evan, it's like, it's like a safe cities. Maybe you have a safe yeah. hospital, or I don't know. It sounds like one of those post-apocalyptic movies where there's no... <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, ma'am, go ahead. Good afternoon, all. I'm Saumia Jairaj. I'm a student at South, South Texas College. Yes, uh, just now, the state rep said that diet is a very important aspect of healthcare. <coughs> I have a question about diet. I'm told that many nutritious food items do not fall into food stamps. Like you cannot purchase certain vegetables or fruits, many nutritious items with food stamps. If we have to give that much importance, as we all know diet is important, why is that not implemented or why is that not taken care of why is that people cannot purchase the better food items with food stamps well again i will have to say a lot of that has to do with federal issues okay um and and i hate to keep saying that but 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 a lot of that has to do with that um Again, I think you've got you've got a, you've got some good ideas, and there are programs uh, uh, that Texas does provide um, concerning diet and things of that nature. But quite frankly, um, I think your idea has merit; it needs to be looked at. But you know, um, passing legislation to allow these things moves at a snail's pace. You know, uh, Dr. Kalen, I'm thinking about how we sometimes work against our own self-interest, you know, the stuff that you're advocating. I seem to remember a few years ago, a previous commissioner of agriculture in the state of Texas, possibly before you arrived here, made a decision to ban fried food and to ban cupcakes on birthdays in the schools. And that was seen to be somehow crossing the line. And the current agriculture commissioner, when he came in, made a decision to reinstate the deep fat fryers and to reinstate cupcakes in schools. I mean, it sort of seems to go against much of what we're talking about. If we're incentivizing people to embrace healthy behavior, and then we create the opportunity for them to, right? Well, I mean, in general, I would say there's a lot to be improved about the food stamps program. But I'm glad we have it. And there are some threats for example, now that the requirements get harder, people are going to fall off. So, for example, uh, do you qualify with a car of a certain price? And now they're going to make it even harder if you happen to have a car. Right. You can't get some of these requirements. So there's a there's a bun, and th that that is coming federally. That that is correct. And um, so thank you for raising it. So firstly, I mean, it it is one route for people to get support on food. But your point is good, which is it's not just food; it's what kind of food do you have access to, and it's broader as well. Most of the healthier food costs more. There's a whole sort of the food system is is is, is its own um, challenging scenario. But the one thing, let me just flip this for a second because I think we all agree that eating better is better for us. I, I want to dig in just a little bit. I think there are going to be policy issues that that you're touching on, for example, with what you're able to purchase, say, with food stamps and other policy issues. Uh, again, stepping down a notch in this in the world that that I'm playing in right now, we are looking at, you know, for people with you know, very high, uh, high people with high diabetes, high A1C levels, for example, who are quite sick with several comorbidities, how can we start leveraging either food as medicine or other kinds of support? And although intuitively it feels right, I do, this is, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to the hot spotting thing. Please, yes, you I, were wanted, waiting I, wanted, for it. I wanted to, I was going to go but, there last. That's it, great. Go the, back to it. You know, the, the, it, the and, and so just to cut to the chase, this was, um, I don't know how many of you read an article. It was now 15, 18 years ago. Atul Gawande, who now leads the, the company that um, Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan brought together. Was a writer for The New Yorker many years ago. Was a writer for The New Yorker. And actually right. one of the, the articles that sort of brought him to fame was an article around hotspotting. This was an activity that was happening in Camden, New Jersey, where they were looking at, they, they were really smart about putting together data from their community, like their, um, their ambulances, the police, and the fire, and things like that. And then they would get that data to start seeing who's actually coming to the hospital 
frequently. And this was a while back. Now many of us talk about doing that. So let, who are the people that keep returning to the hospital? Let's identify them. This is the hotspotting piece. And then let's target a whole range of interventions that go beyond what happens in the hospital to really support them. And it was a beautiful article, but there was also really great work with some great on-the-ground organizations. And it's been happening for a while now. Uh, we all, you know, have built varieties of programs that put, you know, case management around these patients. They go out with them to their homes and support them. So kudos to this group in, in New Jersey, even though this is 15 plus years, everybody buys it because it feels intuitively right. Um, they did a randomized control trial about what kinds of impacts they were seeing. And so the kinds of impacts that they were seeing by doing a pre-post analysis were, was significant. I mean, they were seeing 30% reduction, 40% reduction in hospitalization when they went and looked after these people outside of the hospital. So a great, great potential intervention. When they did this randomized control trial that was just published, they saw zero effect. Zero. They looked at, the P and I'm, I'm going to tell you the, the issues with it in a moment. Don't worry, I'm not going to say the diet is not important because it's unbelievably important. The, the bunch line here is we have to get more specific than saying diet is important. Especially when we get to a world where we start paying in a certain way, we have to really start asking in which situation, for what population, just how much and how much should we pay for it. And we're going to need to get to that level of detail. So in this case, what happened was there was still a pre-post effect. But because of studying things the way we, they do it, so they, they look at readmission. So the moment, if you start measuring from the time point that someone leaves a hospital, the statistics are such that it's going to what they call revert to the mean. And so the 30% reduction in hospitalization, they were saying. So they said, how did people do pre before we measured them? Then we do this intervention, and how do they do after it? And they saw these huge reductions. But then when they compared it to people that they did nothing to, those people had the same reductions. So if you actually, this is, this is sort of a gold standard of a study. You can't do a better study than these two. And so it's become this, you know, there's a lot of conversation about it. So now, so there the are a couple of things. So the first thing this reminds us is, for goodness sake, we've got to watch our blind spots. Because too many of studies like these are going to really be damaging for what we know to still be true. So we've got to think really carefully about how we actually generate the evidence that is actionable, that really proves to us that we were right. We must do that. Because for 15 plus years, we just didn't test it, and we just believed a certain result, and we found that that wasn't true. Now, what does this show us? It shows us that it doesn't say hot spotting is not a good thing. It doesn't say wrapping case management is not a good thing. It means the program as delivered today did not show uh, a difference between the control arm and the intervention. And it only measured it on certain things. It looked at hospitalization. That's all they did. They looked at inpatient admissions. They didn't look at ED utilization. They didn't look at outpatient. That still costs. They didn't look at how well the patients were doing on a variety of other measures. They admitted themselves. Those are very important. They were working with very sick patients. The, if, you, if you start digging into the data, as we have to do because we're in this field, you realize, and they say it, it hidden in the article, the patients they were working on were doubly as complex as the most complex other patients that every other study had looked at. That's very important. It tells you when you take very complex patients, yes, then maybe they're so sick that you don't get that much difference in hospitalization yeah. if you just do. So, so the point is that we have to get to a place where we have to move beyond diet as a, as a big category and really start getting down to who needs what, just how much, at what price, and then let's figure out the right way to pay for it, and then measure it, and, and see whether we actually got yep. the results we thought we wanted. And that's the complicated part, right? Evan, part. real quick, let me just yeah. say this much. My wife reminds me all the time, it doesn't cost more money to eat healthy. So, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's a big ingredient, so to speak, excuse the pun, but it's true. And I think that's what these, these, these initiatives are showing the folks out there the importance of healthy diet. Good. Uh, this is a good place to end, a, a kind of a generally happy place to end, right? Uh, please thank uh, Dr. Garcia, Representative Guerra, uh, Dr. Kalon, and Dean Krause for being here. Thank them so much. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for sticking with us today. We appreciate it. We love coming down to the Rio Grande Valley, and you can count on the fact that we'll be back again with another event soon. Thanks again to DHR Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, and our sponsors, and again, thanks to all of you. We'll see you again soon.